Hello, and welcome everyone to a stat chat from the American Journal of Transplantation. My name is Grace Lydon. I am a PhD biostatistician with the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients and also a statistical editor for AJT. Today, we are lucky to have with us Dr. Jeff Gaynor from the Miami Transplant Institute talking about his paper now published in AJT titled, The Importance of Avoiding Time-Dependent Bias When Testing the Prognostic Value of an Intervening Event, Two Acute Cellular Rejection Examples in Intestine Transplant. This issue of time-dependent bias in transplantation research is one that I see all the time in the literature. So I'm really excited to dig into this, but I'll start by letting you introduce yourself. Dr. Gaynor, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Lyden Grace, I'm going to, we agreed to, um, uh, uh, Please, uh, yes. not, <laughs> not including the formalities, so we'll do away with them. Um, so anyway, um, my name's Jeff Gaynor. Uh, I have my PhD in biostatistics from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill in 1983. And I have a personal connection to this topic uh, because it was a kind of a small component of my PhD dissertation, uh, which focused on a framework for incorporating repeated covariate measurements into the hazard rate and survival date analysis. So intervening events uh, would be considered kind of a, a subset in a way of repeated covariate measurements over time. Um, <clears throat> Perfect. So this is something yeah. you've been thinking about for some time. And... Well, I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I've had an interest in the topic, um, and so maybe we can just go to the first slide of uh, the references. Absolutely. Um, okay, thank you. So I wanted to just highlight, so these are the first seven references in the paper, and uh, we're going to get into the three uh, proper methods, um, but I wanted to highlight, so references one through four uh, focus on the first method, the time-dependent covariate method. Uh, references five and six uh, refer to the landmark uh, method, and reference seven is the um, uh, the third method. Uh, <laughs> uh, my mind's a blank for a second. I'm sorry. Uh, the semi-Markov. Uh, the, oh, thank you. The semi-Markov modeling method. Uh, and um, so... Uh, the Mantle Buyer paper and the Crowley and You paper are classic papers on uh, utilizing time dependent covariate to handle uh, uh, an intervening event. And specifically in the first three references, uh, I, um, coincidentally, uh, the first major data set that was looked at in the early to late 1970s was. Uh, analysis of the Stanford heart transplant data. And people were Classic. trying to address uh, how do we determine the prognostic value of receiving a heart transplant uh, with that data? And, and then the idea of time dependent or mortal time bias was uh, introduced and addressed. And, and then a little bit later in the early to mid eighties, um, uh, the landmark uh, method was uh, introduced in, in handling clinical oncology data. And as you can see in the fifth reference by Anderson, Kane, and Gelber, analysis of survival by tumor response. So in that case, they were looking at uh, chemotherapy um, and testing uh, in patients to see if there was response or not. And then what was the prognostic value of having a response? So the same type of uh, data. Um, and, but in oncology. And then reference seven, um, I was lucky enough actually in 1982 when I was still a graduate student to attend the annual meetings of the American Statistical Association in Cincinnati. And um, Nan Laird from Harvard uh, gave an invited uh, talk, uh, which was about this paper, reanalysis of the Stanford Heart Transplant data. And so, uh, that's where the semi-Markov modeling method uh, uh, came to be in terms of uh, applying it to this situation. Absolutely. So this, this field has a long history. And just taking a step back for folks who are coming into this fresh, 
this time dependent bias, as you've been saying, can arise when someone's interested in the association or effect of an intervening event on usually a survival outcome. So for example, the effect of transplant on say survival after listing or the prognostic value of, in this paper's case, acute cellular rejection on post-transplant graft loss. So in addition to your personal history with this, can you tell me more about what motivated you to pursue this topic now? What problem in particularly transplantation were you aiming to solve? Oh, uh, okay. So why don't we go to the next slide? Um, so uh, I first would like to highlight, so I've, I've worked in intestinal transplant data in my 21 years being at the Miami Transplant Institute, and I've worked in liver transplant, but I've worked mostly in kidney and kidney pancreas transplant. And uh, some years back, I uh, read these I would call them classic papers by Frederick Port and Robert Wolf, uh, one in the Journal of the American Statistical Association, I'm sorry, the Journal of the American Medical Association, Statistics and Medicine and the New England Journal of Medicine. For anybody who hasn't read these papers, uh, clinician or statistician, they're three classic papers. Um, and they use the time-dependent covariate method. And in this case, it was uh, in analyzing the um, prognostic uh, value of receiving a deceased donor kidney transplant and uh, patients that were on the wait list for kidney transplant and how to uh, handle that type of data. Uh, so um, I've had an interest in uh, the methods and over the years, there have been numerous papers published in kidney transplantation in terms mm -hmm. of prognostic value of kidney transplant in certain subgroups, say in obese patients and older patients, so forth over the years. But not every paper has used proper methodology. And it's fairly common still today to uh, see, read papers, clinical papers in transplantation where um, time-dependent bias is, is not addressed. Um, <clears throat> so in intestinal transplantation, I was working four years ago uh, with Dr. Viana, uh, analyzing the intestinal transplant data that we had. And we were in the process of completing our analysis of looking at prognostic factors. And uh, there was a paper published in the American Journal of Transplantation where uh, they looked at the prognostic value of uh, uh, having an acute uh, cellular rejection and also the prognostic value of experiencing severe acute rejection, um, but they did not account for this time-dependent bias. And so that's where I got the idea that at some point, I'd like to uh, use our own data to demonstrate using the proper methods and the type of amount of bias and type of bias that can uh, happen if, if it's not taken into account, the, this bias. Absolutely. So let's explain what this bias is that can arise. It goes by a lot of names. Your paper refers to it as time-dependent bias. I've often seen it as immortal time bias, which sounds like something very science fiction. But the basic idea behind it is that when you have an intervening event, it is a mistake and it, it leads to bias. If you analyze people who experience the intervening event as if they had always been in that clinical state. So this is a nice graphic illustrating this. For example, if people enter a study cohort and later receive a prescription, it would be wrong to categorize them as always having received that pres prescription. And in fact, you're assigning extra time to the state of having a prescription, immortal time, because they couldn't die. We know they lived to receive the prescription. And ultimately, as you lay out really nicely in this paper, this results in underestimating the hazard for the intervening event state and overestimating the hazard for the pre-event state. So that's the wrong way to do this. In your paper, you nicely lay out three alternatives that avoid this time-dependent bias. Could you briefly describe these three statistical approaches for us? Yes. Um, so uh, the first uh, method, as I've alluded to uh, with uh, some of these uh, references, which are the first seven references in our paper, so we have the time-dependent covariate approach. Uh, 
uh, using Cox regression. Um, or it could just be a log rank test, but properly accounting for uh, the state, uh, the clinical state that the patient's in at a given time. So as uh, you see in the slide, the patient crosses over into the intervening event state at the time uh, uh, of that uh, transition occurring. And so one person can contribute follow-up time uh, in both clinical states. So in this case, in intestinal transplantation, patients transplanted, everybody is free of acute rejection at, at baseline, time zero date of transplant. And then they're followed over time, they're taking immunosuppression and so forth. And at some point, some patients, a certain percentage uh, of patients will develop an acute cellular rejection. It may even be a severe acute rejection, uh, but no patients start out at time zero having the rejection. So that's where the time dependent bias comes in. If mm -hmm. one is trying to analyze the prognostic effect of having rejection, um, the bias comes in if, if it's assumed uh, to occur at time zero. Absolutely. And the semi-Markov model, I'll come to the landmark uh, method in, uh, in a minute. Uh, so the semi-Markov model, um, uh, and I'm going kind of chronologically because the first and the third uh, methods were really introduced in the early to mid 1970s and the landmark mm. uh, method came a little bit later. So, um, uh, so in the semi-Markov modeling approach, uh, one is interested say in, well, what is a uh, graph survival following the occurrence of a, uh, an acute rejection or graph survival following the occurrence of severe acute rejection? Uh, and then how do you consider the prognostic value of having one of these um, uh, clinical events? And so free rejection uh, graph survival is considered uh, in the semi-Markov modeling approach. So it's slightly different than the time-dependent covariate approach. And the time-dependent covariate approach, time is always time following transplant. And at a given time following transplant, you're comparing the hazard rates between patients that are in the post-transplant, I'm sorry, post-rejection state versus the pre-rejection state. And the semi-Markov modeling approach, um, time zero for the post-rejection state is actually at the time of rejection. And then patients are followed post-rejection and compared to the pre-rejection graft survival experience. So very similar, but slightly different in terms of the time scale. The landmark method is, is kind of different. So the landmark method, it's a simpler uh, approach. Um, a landmark time is chosen. So it's a subjective choice. A certain time, in this case, uh, in intestinal transplant, uh, we chose one month and three months post-transplant. So it, at one month at that landmark time, uh, we consider only patients that are still at risk at that time of, of having graft loss. And patients that have rejection after that landmark time are not uh, considered in terms of their rejection. So at that landmark time, it's who has had a rejection up to that time point and who has not had a rejection. And then you have two very uh, clearly defined groups to compare in terms of graft survival following that landmark time. But the problem with the landmark method is you lose certain information. You're, you don't include it in the analysis. So statistical power uh, can be less compared to the other two uh, methods. That's great. That's a really nice distinction that you made between Cox regression with a time-dependent covariate versus the semi-Markov model with the time scale resetting as the main difference. I think that's a really helpful way to describe that. And the landmark model is interesting. You're right. You, you immediately cut down your sample size when you're restricting to people who have, you know, survived without failure to a particular point in time. It's it's necessarily going to be less than or equal to the number you had at baseline for the study. And also with the landmark model, you basically, like you said, don't look into the future at all, um, whether to have people move between states or to incorrectly assign them to a state, you know, at the beginning, you purely look at what's happened up until that landmark time, which is, it can be useful in some situations for sure, but um, you work with a smaller sample. And sometimes if people aren't working with registry data all the time, like I am, that can be, you know, a real consideration. 
So as with all things in statistics, it's an art as much as a science. So, you know, choosing between three different methods that all work for something, uh, you offer some nice guidance in your paper as far as how to make that choice based on some quantitative differences. And you kind of alluded to this of how, you know, you lose some power with the landmark method and also the choice of landmark time is subjective. In your paper, you recommend use of Cox regression with the time-dependent covariate, which is what I see most in the literature these days when people are, you know, avoiding this bias appropriately. Can you briefly say some of the strengths of, of this approach, in your opinion? Well, um, <clears throat> you, you're helping me a lot, Grace, because I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> and once I feel nervous, I can't get rid of it. But uh, in any event, uh, so uh, with the time-dependent covariate uh, methodology, uh, there's quite a bit of fl flexibility in uh, modeling uh, the results. So we could be looking at um, uh, the hazard rate of graft loss um, at a given time point, say time T post-transplant, and comparing that hazard rate between patients that at that moment in time have experienced a rejection versus those that have not, okay? But we could also include other variables into that Cox model, uh, which would account for, uh, let's say, uh, time since the development of rejection. Uh, uh, so that could be a, an extra covariate that one might be interested in determining, or how long has it been since uh, the rejection occurred? So time to developing the rejection and time since the development of the rejection. Both variables could be included in, in, in addition to just uh, um, analyzing whether or not there has been a rejection. So there's a lot of flexibility with the time-dependent covariate approach, similar to the semi-Markov modeling approach. But the one difference um, is, especially with um, graph survival data, is typically in the first year post-transplant, kidney transplant, intestinal transplant, the hazard rate of graft loss starts out at the maximum at the beginning. And during the first year, the graft loss rate, fortunately, is, is decreasing rather sharply over time. And the time-dependent covariate approach, since it's modeling time as time since uh, transplant, better accounts for the decrease in the hazard rate over time, whereas the semi-Markov modeling approach uh, for patients that have had rejection, time is time since rejection, it doesn't automatically account for that. You would have to, in your model, try to account for time since transplant. So they're similar, the two uh, methods, but um, we believe that the time-dependent covariate approach is maybe generally uh, would offer uh, uh, greater statistical power. And as we've already discussed, the landmark uh, method, uh, it's easy to use, and it's probably the most widely used of the three methods if we look in the clinical transplant literature, uh, but uh, with the caveat that it, it may suffer from a reduced uh, statistical power compared to the other two approaches. And that's a really good reminder that uh, correctly modeling the shape of the hazard function does actually have an impact on power, as with all things in terms of getting the model right. So that's another reason why, you know, Cox regression, its flexibility does actually translate into higher power, which is something that I'm not sure everybody always keeps in mind. So you saw major differences in your clinical findings using these approaches versus the incorrect time-dependent bias approach. In particular, not only the magnitude of association change, but also the direction of association. And the bias approach found that acute cellular rejection was actually protective for graph loss, which I think really illustrates the impact that this analytic decision can have. You might think, oh, it's just a statistical nuance, but it, it can fundamentally affect the direction of your results and, and even cause you to have incorrect conclusions. So to wrap up our discussion today, what would you say are the main takeaways for the transplant community, you know, statisticians, clinicians, all of us, from this case study in time-dependent bias? Uh, well, you did a nice job summarizing for me, Grace. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, as as you mentioned, uh, one 
really needs to uh, address uh, a situation where uh, they're looking at the prognostic value of some event that doesn't occur pre-transplant, that occurs post-transplant, some clinical events such as acute cellular rejection. And if one doesn't take into account uh, the fact that this event can occur post-transplant, then it leads to this type of time-dependent immortal time bias and a severe underestimation of the hazard ratio can occur to the point that uh, in some cases, uh, one might conclude incorrectly that there's a significantly favorable impact of this intervening event when in fact, there is really no difference or when there is a significantly unfavorable impact as we saw with acute rejection, but with the time uh, uh, dependent biased approach, uh, you would conclude that there's no effect of, of this intervening event. Uh, so it's very important, it's very important. And then the magnitude of the hazard ratio, even for severe acute rejection, is underestimated when mm -hmm. using the bias method. So it's best to, if you can avoid uh, having bias in your analysis to make it as accurate as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just see this all over the place. I see it on the pre-transplant side as well. Often people will want to understand the prognostic value of something that's measured at transplant and their outcome is something like transplant rate. And you just have to think very carefully about that and make sure, you know, you know what time zero is. And if time zero is listing and you're interested in something after listing, that you handle it appropriately. Likewise, if transplant is time zero and you have an intervening event after transplant, like rejection, it has to be handled appropriately. So thank you so much for joining us. This was really a terrific discussion about a topic that is highly relevant. I know the readers of AJT will find your work as interesting as I did. And I look forward to future discussions that our community might have about this type of bias. So to everyone Great. listening, thank you for tuning into this stat chat and see you next time.